Welcome to the Victory Speaks Inspired Conversation Series, where iron sharpens iron. That's you and me sharpening each other. I am your host, Nicole Waldron, your voice of victory and your mental fitness coach. And I'm on a mission to create inspiring life conversations with everyday experts, unsung heroes and thought leaders that will empower us to live a victorious lifestyle. As you join me on this journey through these inspired conversations, I hope you will be inspired to have intentional conversations that will lift you up and enhance your life. No matter the type of conversations we have, good, bad, funny, you name it, it can all be inspiring. Tonight, I invite you to get comfy, get a nice drink or a snack, grab a notepad, as you just never know when a wisdom key can be dropped. Please share this with your friends and get ready to engage with us. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. It is Nicole here, your voice of victory and your mental fitness coach, coming to you live actually tonight from Quebec City, Quebec in Canada. And I have a special guest tonight. And I really don't want to delay too much because he is, if you know, if you are a victory listener, you know what I'm going to say? Just by reading about him and what he's doing, he is already super califragilistic espialidocious in my book. And so my guest tonight is doing something phenomenal. And guess what? He has a little bit of heritage like me. Do you hear my accent changing? Yes, you hear a little tricky thing happening in there. So I am going to bring on Ian to join me now. Give him a warm welcome. Give him some love in the chat. You know, give him some flowers. If you're live or on the replay, let him know that you're out there. Welcome, Ian, to the Victory Speaks show. Thank you very much for having me. Well, you know, thank you for making yourself available. So Ian, you are doing so many great things in so many great spaces. But before we get into that, tell us about Ian. Uh, my name is Ian Kamau. Um, I'm a child of two filmmakers from Trinidad. I was born here in Toronto. Um, I'm an artist, a writer, and a designer. Um, what else? I don't know. I'm a lifelong person who's lived in Esplanade in downtown Toronto. I think that's so, about it. So what type of artist? Because, you know, there's visual artists, there's, you know, the, the dance. What type of artist are you? Um, what kind of artist am I? I uh, I'm a couple different kinds of artists. I never really, I don't really like to to define very clearly like what kind of artist I am. I'm, I am certainly a writer. Um, I used to make music. I hope to be making music again relatively soon. Um, I'm a graphic designer. I used to paint and illustrate. I do less of that now than I did before. And um, most recently I'm a filmmaker, but because I, I prefer not to say like so many different things, which is why I usually just say I'm an artist. Well, you know, it's, it's good, you know, because when I think about artists like yourself, like I'm looking at your guitars behind you and I'm just so stoked. I wish I could play the guitar, mm. but you know, to see the creativity. And when I, when I look at creative people, we tend to go into many things and we don't have to be locked into the one box. So multidisciplinary is really, you know, so, so great to have. And now artists have a lot more respect than they used to because you know, as a Trinidadian, you're growing up as a, a Caribbean person and certain mm -hmm. heritage as an artist, we were kind of like looked down on. Now, has that changed for you, you find, now that you, you've gotten a, a little uh, more mature? Um, I don't know. You know, I, I come from, like, when I first started, I was a teenager and I was making music and it was hip-hop music. And hip-hop music was certainly looked down upon at that time. I, In many ways, I think it still is because people have a of um, a stereotype, I guess, about what hip hop is. And hip hop has sometimes kind of reinforced that stereotype as well. But I'm not, I don't know, it's, it doesn't bother me so much if people look down. Uh, I think the main thing is to be able to experience what it is that a person is doing and judge it as such, as opposed to, you know, throwing it in a in a category of something and, stere and stereotyping that particular thing. Certainly if you don't necessarily know anything about it, you know, so. Right. And now you talked about your parents as you were, you were introducing yourself. They are artists. Tell us a little bit about them. 
Uh, my parents, uh, Claire Preto and Roger McTair, um, they are they are filmmakers. They were both filmmakers. They're two of the first three black filmmakers in the country of Canada. They came uh, from Trinidad and came to Toronto in 1970, went to school at Ryerson and told stories through documentary film about predominantly black people in Canada. Those are my parents. And so are they, uh, how did they shape you? And how did even the culture of Trinidad shape you, even though you were, you were born here? I was born here, yeah. So how did the Trinidadian culture shape you and being, and being here born a Canadian into becoming the artist that you are today and the man that you are today? Because you're not just an artist, you are a man within your own self. Yeah. Um, how did it shape me? I don't know. I don't know exactly because it's so much of my self, you know, like both of my parents are Trinidadian, a lot of, uh, well, I mean, my all of my family and a lot of like my parents, friends, what you would consider to be aunts and uncles, even if they weren't necessarily related to me, were uh, Trinidadian people or Caribbean people, you know, Bayesians, Grenadians. Um, and so, you know, certainly when I was younger, I spent a lot of time in, in Caribbean homes, even though they were Caribbean homes here in Toronto. I went to Trinidad every year until I was, I think, four, but I don't, there are pictures, but I don't really remember it. And then I went back when I was 16 and I've been, I don't know how many times since then. At one point I was going roughly every two years. Wow. Um, I've probably been 15, 16 times to Trinidad at various times in my life for various reasons and for various lengths of time. So, you know, I feel very comfortable there. I feel very comfortable here. And I, th I think um, it's, hard to, it's hard to draw a line between like, me as a kind of like a, a Canadian or a Torontonian right. and me as a Trinidadian, because there is no line really, like you're moving through all of those cultures and all of the other cultures that are here constantly. Right. But my grounding certainly is in, you know, Trinidadian culture and food and language and art and and those kinds of things so it's just it's just mashed up with a bunch of other other things at the same time i like how you say it mash up it <laughs> <laughs> do you see a difference in because you're going back and forth do you see a difference in the trinidadian artistry and how they move versus here uh hmm i mean i i, I don't know because i think there are a lot of different expressions of what it means to be Trinidadian. Like there are lots of different expressions of what it means to be Canadian. You know what I mean? Like hey. <laughs> you could you could live in Toronto and you can live in Esplanade in yes. one of the buildings, or you could live in Bridal Path in a big house. Right. You could spend the majority of your time on Eglinton West or Queen Street West. Those are very different things. And Trinidad's an entire country. If you were in the north, if you were in the south, if you were by, you know, San Fernando, that would be a different experience than if you were in Port of Spain or if you were, you know, if you go to La Luna, if you go to Las Cuevas, those are different experiences. If you, you know, you could be in Trinidad and you could not be into Calypso or you could not be into Soca or you could you could be more into the literary culture or the you could be into the carnival arts. You could be into jazz. You could be into all kinds of different things. So. There, there is a difference. I, you know, I find Trinidadians are all more communal, certainly, than Canadians. There's a little more individual. No, it's just, I mean, there's a lot more individualism over here. I think we have less of that kind of, um, we have less of that sense of community. But I also know that that's very much changing in Trinidad, too. From Even in my life, from when I was going in the 90s to when I'm going now, I can see the difference, even just in the neighborhood where my grandmother's house is, like, it used to just be houses everywhere and there would be people across the street and, and now it's full of businesses, factories, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's changing rapidly as well. So, I love how your mind works. I love how you were able to describe just a different, you know, I would say almost hemispheres and cultures within the two countries. You, you are definitely not just an artist, but you're, I can tell you're a storyteller. And now mm. speaking of the storytelling, you mm. know, what, you know, when our, our wonderful Fenella told me all about what you were doing, I was so excited because she knows I'm a mental health advocate. Yeah. And um, 
you have worked on this production called Lost that is going to be in the Luminato Festival. First of all, congratulations. Like, that's huge. I'm really giving it up to you. I'm like, let's give ourselves the Owen victory is for ovation. So we're going to give you giving you a pat on the back right now if you were here, I'm giving you. Um, how, first of all, how does it feel to even be a part of Luminato? How did that even come about? Um, it came about because, so I've been doing a residency at the theater center, um, with the artistic director there. Her name is Ashlyn Rose. And, you know, we've been slowly developing this piece as life was happening over a very long period of time. And we just started having conversations with different organizations. And she specifically was talking to, you know, different arts organizations about that the work was happening right. and um you know luminato have has shown interest in the piece for quite some time i did uh, basically a workshop version of back in i think it was 2018 2016 something like that i can't remember we did a workshop version back then and we've just you know stayed in touch with them they've been watching it kind of develop we did another workshop version uh in montreal as well uh, I can't I can't remember where that was, but yeah. So we've just in in parallel, they've been watching the development. The theater center predominantly does development through their residency programs, and so you know I've benefited from from being at the theater the theater center and um, just working on it. And Luminato, I think, has kind of been watching from the uh, maybe it's not even the sidelines. They've been watching, so that's how it came about. You know, it's it's one of those things you never know who's watching you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, 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 and I, I know it from my own self and, you know, as even Love More, who's watching online, who just said she's giving you some ovation there. Thanks, Love More. Is that you have to do what you're doing because you believe it, because you love it. Because if you do it because you think such and such should be watching or for the praise of others, it's mostly you'll get praise from other people you don't even know that's watching. I've found that like it, it just surprises you, the people that will be looking at you from the silent. I'll tell you, Ian, like, there are people that I have met who have watched this show, but they've never put a comment. And um, I remember doing a, a gig for speaking one time. Yeah. And I said, how did you find out about me? And they said, I've been watching your show. And I said, but you've never put a comment in the chat. You yeah. never even liked it. And yeah. so you really just got to be about your craft, doing your stuff. And the fact that you've been working on this and, and perfecting it for nine years, and now it's in Illuminato, mm. I think it's a great testament to anyone listening, especially young people who think, you know, you have to get it like right away. It yeah. takes time. So tell us about loss because it's a power, just that one word is so powerful. What is loss? What is this production loss about? So loss is a live arts multimedia performance. It's, it's a little bit of film. It's a little bit of a reading. It's a little bit of poetry, mostly written by my father. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's accompanied by music, um, live music. And it's a it's a story. It's a family story that is about mental health, but it is it doesn't use any of the clinical or academic terms around mental health. It talks about mental health as if you were sitting inside of a family, and the family happens to be my family. So that's what it is. It is not it's not a play in that I'm not acting or anything like that. There's no set. It's just me telling stories. Um, yeah, in a, in a multimedia environment. The idea basically is that people would come uh, enter into that world, both the physical world and the psychological world of the of the story. And they experience what I've experienced through the piece. And hopefully, you know, it reflects some part of their life um, as I'm communicating about mine and my family's. So as you talk about sharing your story, if it's not too much, you can share us a little bit about the story, because as I read about you and what you were doing, you were experiencing loss, you were experiencing depression. And then you're, I understand that your grandmother transitioned mm -hmm. and that created a, a movement in you. But, but well, tell us about the, this journey. So uh, in, in 2011, I had a very bad, long uh, period of depression. I'm not sure if I was experiencing depression before. I certainly have experienced depression and managed depression consistently after. Um, but that's when I understood that there was some kind of a, a problem. Like I, I wasn't well. Right. And um, it got me thinking about my grandmother. I never knew my grandmother. 
Mm. I never, I never met her. My grandmother passed away when my father was 10. That was 20, uh, it was, yeah, 35 years before I was born. So I never met her. Wow. But I did know that she passed away probably younger than I am now. Okay. And I never knew how she passed away. My family didn't really speak about it. Mm. So I started just thinking about that question. How did she pass away? And, you know, I think in one way or another, we're living the lives of the people that came before us. Um, You know, my family would not, a lot of my family, my immediate family, my father, my aunts, my uncles, myself, my cousin, none of us would exist if it wasn't for my grandmother existing. And so the fact that we are here uh, is directly related to her being here. And to not know her and to not know how she passed, I think is um, it's something that means that there's a part of myself that I didn't that I didn't and don't necessarily understand. You know, you understand yourself through yourself and your experiences, but also through your people and the places that you're from, your family, that kind of thing. So I wanted to understand more about her and the circumstances of her life and her death. That's that's powerful, the fact that she went there. And you know, you said manage your the depression. Because mm-hmm. I'm not gonna give it your depression because it's 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 an illness, it's by itself. How mm-hmm. did you manage the depression? Um, this is not like one way. Mm-hmm. It's a thing that I consistently manage. Um I, I, there was a point where the end of it, <clears throat> the end of the piece was very much like, it felt like walking into the sunset and I had to rewrite the end because it's, it's not true. Mm. You know, this is, this is a story that's about my life. It's come together as I've learned more. And also as I've been living my life, uh, it doesn't have like a, a wonderful storybook ending necessarily. Um, but there is more understanding uh, at the end than there is at the beginning. Um, and I'm not great at managing, um, that sense of sadness, uh, but the way that I attempt to do it, um, is I rest. I make sure that I'm connected with people that are friends of mine, um, that are good friends of mine. I've I've removed myself from people that I didn't feel like were, some of them actually were good friends of mine, but they weren't consistent or that kind of thing. And then some people that just were not absolutely, um, you know, a lot of it is just health, like, you know, eating properly, sleeping properly, drinking water, being hydrated. I haven't gone to the gym. The, the you know, COVID stopped me from going to the gym at a certain point in time, and I haven't got back. And so, you know, one of the things when the show is done is I'm going to you know, attempt to just improve my health to the level that it was before COVID hit. I think COVID damaged a lot of us beyond. Yes the illness itself or people that actually got sick or people that lost their lives. I think the the impact of COVID hasn't really fully been seen yet psychologically um, and potentially culturally and socially as well. Um, I think we're still dealing with the implications. And I think similar to like, you know, I grew up listening to or watching documentaries and hearing people talk about World War II. I think COVID is that is to the same extent as something like a world war we're going to be talking about it for the rest of our lives you know so um yeah you know the fact that you're able to talk about it is huge because so many people don't talk about it black men don't talk about it men don't talk about it boys don't talk about it and it's the taboo piece and you know as you share your journey and your story and you you speak about loss there's also i see this big victory you know, I always find the opportunity in the crisis when I when I look at it, and I'm looking at just a couple of the comments that are coming in. You know, uh, psychotherapist Andrea Boya says great conversation, and and she's always right there in it. Joan Pierce saying, "I'm listening in the car, and I'm so proud of you." Hi, Joan. Hi, Joan. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> known him from birth, literally. She puts <laughs> it right there, you know, and you never know that one moment what it can change. The fact that you're doing this. Have you had any like uh, feedback over the, the few years that you're doing it and responses from people who have seen and experienced loss? Yeah. yeah, so I'll I'll tell you a story. Like a long time ago, 
when I was doing music more consistently, this is probably 20 years ago, maybe even a little bit more, I made a decision to start to perform differently. Um, I wanted to speak more about myself. Um, and there was a show, it was called The Good People Party. A friend of mine actually lives across the street from me, used to promote this show. It was like a hip hop show. It was very small. It used to happen at the Now Lounge up on Church Street, just below Dundas. And, um, you know, small group of people, maybe 60, 70 people in a tiny room. Basically, it was like a little bar. And uh, he asked me to go there and perform. I was doing like hip hop and spoken word stuff at the time. And... Um, I had been working on a couple of songs that were more personal and I went I went, and I decided that I wanted to perform those songs that I hadn't necessarily performed before that were more specifically about me. And, you know, people used to come up to me and say, you're, you're very good or, you know, you're, um, you know, in Toronto at the time, they would say, you sound like you're from New York. That was one of the biggest compliments you could get as a, as a, as a, as a hip hop artist from Toronto. And this time I went and performed those songs and people came up to me after and they told me stories that were a reflection of the stories that I had told. They told me stories about themselves and it shifted a lot for me. Um, you know, people that I knew to be, you know, honestly, guys that were like kind of like street guys who had very like difficult lives and whatever. One person in particular, I won't say his name, but he came up to me and started talking to me. And as he was telling me about his story, he started to cry. Right. And um, I realized that there was something about telling a story that is specific to you that becomes very universal because these are things that people, the more vulnerable and the more personal that the stories are, the more you realize that other people are walking around with those stories and not communicating them. And when someone does say those things out loud, sometimes in front of a group of people, it gives people a sense that it's okay, at least to communicate with that person and hopefully to communicate with the people in their lives, that story that they may be hiding or that they may only tell to their closest friends or maybe not tell anybody whatsoever to be able to relate and connect to another person that is sharing the same stories. Because we all have loss. We all deal with a bunch of different things. We all do some things in the dark that we wouldn't want on a billboard on on Queen and Spadina, but these are things that we all do. And so when someone steps out and says, hey, this is um, this is something that I've been experiencing. It's difficult to speak about or whatever, but I'm going to speak about it anyway. It's not as specific to that person. Realistically, realistically, it is gets to the 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 it gets more to the core of our humanity and it opens people up even for that moment to be able to share that same story. And to me, that's the that's the thing that that changed about like my that's the thing that I wanted to pursue is what I should say. And I think um, just like therapy, just like talk therapy, I think not everybody uh, talk therapy is not necessarily for every person. But I think there are other ways that we can think through if you know, and I'm not I'm by no means I'm not opposed to therapy, but um, there are other ways that we can tell our stories and and reflect our stories to other people and also back to ourselves so that we can be clearer in our heads to make decisions that are different to deal with some of the issues that we can accomplish or to look at, let's say, the systems that we're in, things that we may not have the same level of effect over, but at least understand them so we understand this may not just be my issue, you know? You know, as I listen to you, um, it's so profound how I was going to ask you the power of storytelling and you went right where I was feeling it. And mm -hmm. especially when we are dealing with our mental health and wellness and we forget our mind is our brain and our brain is our mind, you know, and that, um, our, when we take care of our brain health, we take care of our thoughts, our emotions, all these things come into play. And we have to remember chemicals go out of sync, just like different chemicals in our body goes out of sync. They're all connected mm -hmm. and removing the shame and the fact that you're allowing people to come into a space where they can hear your story and hear your truth and feel the strength of it and giving them permission to even share their stories. You know, what would you say to a young black man right now who is struggling 
with their mental health and wellness. And whether it is, you know, they may just be having a little bit of it or a lot of it, but at the end of the day, they're just struggling to really accept. I just, I'm just not doing well. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, I think that's the first thing is to, to say or to acknowledge that you're not doing well. You can't solve a problem if you can't identify it. Good one. I think there's a way to learn more and to uh, learn more about that problem and where it emerges from. Like in our society, a lot of the larger conversation about mental health is actually very individual. It doesn't talk about like the systems that we're in, the society that we're in, the message that the messages that we get told. There is there are a lot of very, very negative messages that are about black people, black women, black men that come at us every single day that we live with inside of our heads. They come from the media as much as they come from our family, as much as they come from our friends, the education system, you know, our partners or just what's, you know, generally in the world. Um, it is true that the world doesn't necessarily value black people to the level of other groups of people. Um, that's true. And it, it's not, I don't, I think it's important that we acknowledge that, um, not use it as a crutch, but, but do acknowledge that's something that exists in the world in order that we can navigate ourselves like out of that, those kinds of situations. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, there is help and support yeah. to make sure that we're around people that are supportive of us in towards the the best of ourselves because there will also be people in our lives that are supportive of us to the worst of ourselves or to some gray area that we may not actually want to be at that may not always feel like the nicest feeling for someone who is kind to you to tell you something that you may be doing or a situation that you're in that you may need to remove yourself from it may feel better you know to just go out with your friends and do whatever you're doing, which may not be the best thing necessarily. And I would say discernment, you know, discernment for your own actions, discernment for your friend, uh, friends and family, discernment of the kinds of people that are around you, discernment of the difference between a social issue and an individual issue, or to be able to turn the mirror on yourself and say, this is something that I'm doing wrong. In the middle of all that, there may be racism and all that kind of stuff. There may be anti-blackness, and that's true. But I have to be able to discern between what is that mm -hmm. and what is me, because it's everything basically is on a spectrum in a gray area. Um, you know, and I would and I would say keep going. You know, one of the things they say about I mean, this is kind of heavy, but one of the things they say about suicide is that it is a narrowing. Um, it is a narrowing of it's uh, not being able to see the full reality of what is actually in front of us right. and requires us pulling ourselves out. Like sometimes you can only see one option, but just because you can only see one option doesn't mean that there only is one option. And it takes sometimes being a little bit self-aware when you're in a state that has reduced your ability to see, to understand, even though I can't see that at this moment, I know that if I do these things, I'll be able to pull myself out enough so I have a wider perspective so I can make a different kind of a choice. Um, yeah, so, you know, th that's what I would say. You know, I have a friend, his name is, uh, well, he passed away. His name is Kunle Atiba Thomas, otherwise known as King Rain. And one of the last conversations that uh, I had with him the, at the end of a long conversation, he just said, you know, we had to keep going. We have to keep going regardless of anything else. We just have to keep going, you know? So my goal is to live to like 101. And I never forget him telling me that because it actually is, you know, the last full conversation that I had with him and he had so much more to do, you know? So I think for all of the people that we've lost, I think it's also important for us to like keep going, to tell our stories, to tell their stories um, if they don't have the ability to tell them uh, at the moment for whatever reason. Did I not tell you at the beginning of this conversation that he was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? Like <laughs> seriously, Ian, the wisdom that you're coming with, the this not even you know the awareness, and you know as uh, a friend of mine, you know on the on the line here, Andrea, you know this you are showing a bold love, a bold awareness 
a, a boldness of who you are that is so insightful that is going to help so many people. I think you're a psychotherapist somewhere along the line. You just probably in, but you know what? I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you, there might be like a, a multidisciplinary psychotherapist kind of movement that we need to start because the way that you are sharing, there are so many young people that need to hear what you have just said, older people as well, mm -hmm. but there's so many young men and young black men that need to hear what you are sharing. Um, I'm definitely, we're going to have to be hooking up after this because I got to bring you into some spaces because there's some key spaces of, especially I find in the arts, I find young people in the arts are even more sensitive to the world because they pull from you, you artists pull from the very depth of their soul in a different way than other things. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that it, we need to protect the mind, protect the emotions of artists because they really give fully of themselves. Uh, Karen King is saying wise words, wise words. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's in, everybody's like, all of my mom's people are in the jar in the thing. Huh? So this is, this is, this is, and you know what? We don't even know who is not even writing a comment and we don't know which platforms they're watching on, but I'm seeing the chats. I, and Karen is coming in from LinkedIn. And mm. you know, sometimes people just watch at different points in time. And you know, you talked about loss in the mirror. And so as people come together and they watch this, what do you want them to walk away from this production loss? And I would even say to you, I know you told us about, about the story, but why loss? Why that one word loss? <clears throat> um, loss is a, a where a lot of our trauma comes from. So good. Um, loss is a lot of where our heartache, hurt, the ways that our the ways that our mind works off sometimes in a negative way comes from loss. Um, you know, my father lost his mother when he was ten years old. I don't there. I don't know that there is any replacement for that. I think it changed the entire direction of our family. I don't think anything was the same after that for them, and because for them, not for any of us that came after them. Right. Um, it changed the makeup of the the family. I mean, my great aunt, who's now 105, she, uh, you know, she wanted to like move through the world. And, um, but she also felt a responsibility to make sure that her sister's children, her, her big sister's children were taken care of. And my grandfather was not particularly interested in that. Mm. And so it changed the lives of, of everybody um because she was she was struggling and she didn't get out of that struggle right so loss is at the center loss is at the absolute center of that shift in my family and that's a major loss right to lose a mother to lose the matriarch of the of of our family uh at such a young age you know right. And so, and you know, there's many, it's, it, it could be something as profound as that, but you know, immigration is sometimes a loss of a place. You know, there's loss of friendship, there's a uh, loss of a partner, there's broken relationships, there's loss of parents, loss of children, there's loss of a job, there's loss of, you know, there's like all of those things are things that kind of ripple through our minds uh, and create responses in some cases that are good healthy and in some cases that aren't no not necessarily healthy and um but it's the same thing in order to in order to move forward in the way that we want to because we're always moving forward but in the in order to move forward in the way that we want to we we have to look at the loss that we've experienced and unpack it and that's all that i'm trying to do with this piece and i hope that people come and they they're not they don't see my family i mean you're going to see my family but yeah. they don't see my family necessarily but when they see my father or when they see my mother or when they see trinidad they think about their mother or their father or their sister or their brother or their cousin or someone that they've lost or someone that they're losing or someone that or something or the place that they're from it's it's it is my story, so it's the story that I have the best ability to tell. Um, 
I think it's more personal that way, but I also think that um, it's not intended for people to just watch my story. It's intended for them to consider and to think about their story through my story. Right. So I have a question for you because you're on the Victory Speak show. Mm. And I always ask people, what does victory in life look like to you? Um, to me, it looks like um, fulfillment or actualization. I don't think that, um, and I never say self-actualization because I don't think actualization is only, it is both itself and the community and the society at the same time. But I think a sense of purpose. I've always, I've always believed in purpose and purpose drives us through life. And so I, when you say purpose, what does that look like for you? Mm, when I say purpose, what does that look like for me? This is, this is, this is what I do. You know, like I love storytelling, even just technically. I can tell. <laughs> I love I love storytelling. I love art. I love, that's what I love. You know, some people in, in high school, they play basketball. I was like drawing with my boy Danilo in sketchbooks, you know, like I just, I love walking through the art gallery as much as I love being a grimy hip hop show. Like I love, I love art. It's taken me all over the world. It's taken me to Ethiopia. It's taken me to South Africa. It's taken me to Brazil. It's taken me to Cuba. It's taken me to Europe. It's taken me to Halifax. It's taken me to, you know, <laughs> London, Ontario and London, England, you know, like it helps me connect. It helps me connect with people and I'm, I'm introverted. And so I don't, a lot of my connections have to do with um, experiencing either going somewhere and performing or just realizing that another person was an artist and we had like a similar interest or they, or even if they weren't an artist, they just had an interest in right. let's say music or something, you know? So I think purpose is, is the thing that you're compelled to do, you know? And I think when you do the thing that you're compelled to do, you naturally will, or you hopefully, I should say, I don't know if it's naturally, you, you, you will benefit other people by the way that you put your effort into that thing. And so that, to me, that thing, whatever it is that you want to do, you should, you should do it regardless, you know? Um, because I, it's, cause it's not just for you. It's also for other people to experience. I don't know what I would do if, I don't know, Andre, Lauren Hill or Andre 3000 weren't in the world. Right. Right. You know? I'm sure they're doing it just because they love it, but I love what they do too. And sometimes I'm, I will walk down the street and I'll listen to I don't know. I don't know what song I just want you around or whatever by Lauren Hill or like X factor or something. And now I'm walking through Regent park at like midnight crying because Lauren Hill is telling me about her story, you know? Um, and so, and that's what I think a great artist does. They pursue their, they pursue the thing that they love. They tell their story. And in telling their story, they tell the stories of a lot of other people that don't have the ability to tell their story. So that's what I think purpose is. And that's what I want for artists and black artists specifically. And that's what I've always wanted for black people to be able to actualize themselves in the world uh, in a way that we don't, we don't often get to do because of all the stuff that is holding us back. So we just have to live. It's we, we should be living is great. You know, surviving is wonderful. Living is another stage. Actualizing yourself is a stage beyond that. And to me, that has to do with your purpose. So listen, when are you writing the book? Like seriously? I've written two books. I just haven't got them. I just haven't got them out. I don't have the time. Listen, we're going to have to get you some assistance because what you are dropping here, I feel like I went to university and like sitting at, you know, with my college professor and just getting, you're like one of the best gurus in terms of knowledge, wisdom. I'm, I'm learning so much from you, just the way you put it over. And you are such a natural storyteller. It's beautiful. And I'm not just saying this because I want to stroke your ego. I'm really telling you. It's beautiful to hear how you share, how you express yourself. And I can tell just by the, the, the comments that are coming in the chat, I think people are really enjoying, you know, the nuggets that you're dropping. So is there a particular, some people have it, some people don't. Do you have a quote or a motto, motto that you live by or that guides you? 
not really. There's this there's this quote by Irving Layton that I use all the time. It's called it's a, it's go it's part of a larger poem. I can't remember the name of the poem now. It's at the bottom of my email. A quiet madman never far from tears. <laughs> Ooh, that's deep. It's a great poem too. Okay, I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, look him up. I just yeah. something about that just resonated with me. But it's not necessarily it, you know that's not like an inspirational quote. It's just a statement of a kind of a person. You know. Right. And um, yeah, I, I you know, so what you were saying before is like, I actually think that ev everybody is at their core is naturally creative just by being a human. I think people are naturally great storytellers. Right. And I think for me, I just have spent maybe a little bit more time actually thinking about those things or that kind of thing. But I think it's no different than what was at the core of me when I was a baby. And I think what is at the core of you when you're a child is it exists in all of us, you know, just whether we cultivate it or not. So I'm not, I don't, I don't believe that I'm more of a natural storyteller than any other human being on the face of the planet. I think that's what human beings do. It's one of the things that separate us from other things is that we tell stories. We don't just tell stories in words. We tell stories in a variety of different ways. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm doing anything that's profoundly different than what than what other people than what is in other people's hearts. Certainly, you definitely you definitely are putting it out there, and you're actionable. You know, um, and and when we're dealing with our mental health and wellness, when we're dealing with depression, it it it's it's such a journey, and there's so many levels to depression, right? Um, and the fact that you are consciously walking it out, aware of it willing to speak about it, empower other people to, you know, to, to face what they're dealing with. Um, and sometimes depression can come with anxiety and so many different things, but you're, you're living life and you're recognizing this is something that, that is, that is real for me. And, and you're doing it and you're, you're doing it with your storytelling. You are so aware. And I really am inspired by you. And one of the reasons that I'm inspired by you is I, I sit on so many tables with caregivers in the mental health space. And I would love to bring you, I'm trying not to tear up right now. I would love to bring you before a group of caregivers because what you're doing is instilling hope mm. that especially when you have a loved one dealing with their health, whether it's a physical health or their mental health, it's all connected. And you have this beautiful way of instilling hope and even equipping others in how to deal with their own selves. And I, I share that to you with, with you from my heart. This is, I'm just trying to stay focused now. So I'm going to just ask you a fun question. Mm. Who would you like to have dinner with and why? Andre 3000. Why? And who is that? Who is, man, who is Andre 3000? Listen. Andre 3000 is the greatest rapper alive. <laughs> <laughs> no, I may know the music. I mean, I just know the name. I'm you know, you know a group called Outkast? Yes. Andre 3000 is one of the two guys in Outkast. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so now- He's I the guy that used to have like the platinum wig and the- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's Andre okay. 3000. Okay, okay. He's the guy that did Hey Ya. So Andre 3000 is one of my favorite artists. And part of it is because He's largely actually walked away from doing music, although he does some things, you know, he has a great, well, he has the best verse on Kanye West last album. Mm. Um, but he's, he speaks about himself. He is not into all the flashiness that a lot of like, certainly a lot of contemporary rappers are into. Yeah. Um, he had an article that, uh, got written about him in GQ in a podcast that he did with uh, Rick Rubin, where he spoke about like why a lot of things, but he spoke about why he wasn't in music. And despite the fact that he, they were a diamond selling group that won Grammys and he still, he feels very vulnerable. He feels, honestly, he feels like he's struggling with depression and insecurity. Um, and he talks about, his experiences in a simple, direct, poetic way. 
And he, to me, he's one of the most interesting people in hip hop. I relate to him a lot. And so there's probably there's a bunch of other people I would probably like to sit down and, and speak with a dead or alive. John Coltrane, yeah. Jas Jasmine Sullivan, El, I don't know, Ella Fitzgerald, Bell Hooks, rest in peace, oh Bell Hooks. I would have loved to have a conversation with Bell Hooks or Alice Walker. You know, there are a lot of people, but that's the first person that came into my mind. I think we need to bring you into Stella's place and have a little talk with the young people. They're going to learn so much from you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look back over your years and you're reflecting, and actually, I know you're not an old dude, but just think back, you know, to that younger self who was questioning themselves. And when you were going through that real period of sadness, mm -hmm. you know, and things could have been, you know, sometimes I know with sadness makes us can feel hopeless. We can really just, because, you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I really think that's so much of a part of, of, of our thinking. What would you say to that young, that youth, you know? Um, what would I say? I don't know that I would say anything. I think, um, I don't know that I would say anything. I don't think, you know, when, when someone's like, in relation to the show, let's say. Yeah. I've been saying, yeah, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that, da, 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 da. And some people have been saying, you'll be fine. And it's not help. It's not helpful. Because I don't know, because I'm a realist. So there is actually no guarantee that I'll be fine. Come on now. T tell the truth now. Let's talk about it, Ian. There's no guarantee that I'll be fine. I know people that have lost their lives for a variety of different reasons. I know people in prison for life. You know what I mean? I know people who died at 40 something of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So... There's no guarantee that it'll be fine. But what I wanted at the time was a friend to just sit with me or to to say, hey, let's go have dinner. And we wouldn't we wouldn't have needed to say anything. You know, I was very isolated in my home in the dead of winter by myself. I felt like I was a part of a community and then everything just everybody disappeared. I feel like people were only showing up for like events. I just wanted a friend basically. Yeah. And um, and that's part of the reason why things kind of just fell apart. Cause I was like, oh, I don't think, I don't think I am in a community, you know? Uh, and we're not good at that here. Um, yeah. Part of it is the culture here, that same individualism that I spoke about, but even just the way that our buildings are built or the size of the city or the fact we have to, you know, travel to this place and that place, it's you know what I mean? So I, I don't know that I would say anything because I don't know that that's what I would have wanted. I would have wanted someone to go for a walk with me. That, my friend, my new brother. <laughs> We're brother. family now. We, we, fa we family, man. We family. Listen, if anyone is listening out there, and I really want you to hear what Ian just said, because many people say, well, I don't know how to help. I don't know how to show up. And whether it's a loved one, whether it's a caregiver, can, can, can I take you for dinner? Can we go for some tea? Mm -hmm. Let's go for a walk. Isolation is real. And what I find people tend to do is, you know, they know someone may be feeling depressed or anxious or whatever they're dealing with, and they just leave them. And, you know, just because that person doesn't want to talk, sometimes somebody just needs to be in a space with another person and no conversation is really necessary or not a lot of conversation or you don't need to fix it. You don't need to, not because I'm going through depression. I, I don't need you to fix the depression. Mm -hmm. I just need someone there with me. I just need someone to go do groceries with me or have someone to go to the gym with. And I, I think this piece here is so important that if you really and truly listening to what Ian said. If I had somebody just to go to dinner with, and now we're really finding out through even COVID who our real friends are, what friendship looks like, how we define friendship, how we define community. So, you know, I really, I really appreciate that. And so what's next for you? What's next for you, Ian? The show is next from the 14th to the 18th at the Harbor Front Center Theater with Luminato. That's what's next. And after that, I'm going to sleep for a little bit. Um, I would really like, you know, I did a Kickstarter a couple years ago to do an album project. I would really like to just do that. Not because I expect 
it'll be some enormous thing, but because I really just want to do music again. And I wasn't expecting like the Kickstarter closed in the middle of March, 2020. And so as my Kickstarter closed, the first lockdown happened with COVID and um, my head, I tried, but my head just wasn't in the game. And it was a, obviously a very high anxiety time and uh, nothing I was coming up with I really liked. So I've been thinking about that one of those book projects and also um, and also an album project. But before any of that, I just I want to spend some time resting and I want to have a bit of a I haven't had a summer in years. And so I just want to like have a bit of a summer and, you know, go to the island, go to Hanlon's Point or something like that. <laughs> Look at the wall. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I like that you recognize that you need the rest and that you have the projects on the go, but you can't do the projects without the rest. And thanks, Penelope, for putting up in the chat. Now, look at it. It's so affordable for groups of 10 or more who purchase, you know, $15 tickets. There's a 10%. Come on now, people. <laughs> Come on now, people. If you, if everybody here tells a friend and you go online and look it up and go to Luminato Festival, come out and, sh you know, support Ian and his family and the team and everybody who has put this together. Is there anyone you want to give a shout out to before we, we wrap up this evening? I mean, shout out to everybody at Luminato. Shout out to everybody at the Theater Center and Why Not Theater. Um, shout out all the music. I won't mention every single person, but certainly the production team and the musicians, the lighting designer, the sound designer, everybody that's been working on it. It's not just me that's been working on this. There have been a whole group of people that we've been collaborating on. And everybody has come through the process because some people have also come through the process for a variety of different reasons. Um, and certainly my my father, uh, Roger McTair, my aunt, Dionise McTair, my mom, Claire Preto, because they have been in the in the middle of this and supportive of it uh, long before I was doing interviews or anything about it. And long, quite frankly, long before I was even at the theater center, right. this was even really an idea. They were they were present. And um, I don't think that this would uh, have been a thing at all or been uh, possible if I didn't grow up in with a group of storytellers who were essentially doing something essentially similar to this and me just, you know, watching them or having conversations with them or whatever. And so, you know, my father said, yeah, it's okay to do it. And I, it wouldn't have happened if he didn't say it will be hard, but I think you should do it. The power of support. Ian, it has been an absolute joy having you on the show this Thank evening. You. And for those of you who have been tuning in, Listen, if you didn't get to see the whole thing, go back and watch the replay. It's going to be on the Victory uh, Victory Speaks YouTube channel. It's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be on LinkedIn. But go to the Victory Speaks YouTube channel. Follow, share, because, you know, as I always say, it's not about me. It's about my guests. It's about how you can support them and let their victory speak. Uh, you can follow the Victory Speaks show on Twitter and Instagram at Victory Speaks 7. And Ian, how can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Ian Kamau on most social media platforms. That's the best way to get at, get at me. The best way to get at you. We, we will try not to stalk you. Um, we'll try to be good with that. And you know, as I say to you, uh, Ian shared so much about his story and what he's he's gone through and the wisdom and the knowledge that he's learned. And it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, and it's actually my own quote, but love is in the details. And mm -hmm. so be loving to each other, be kind to each other, be loving to someone else. You know, do a surprise, do an act of kindness. Every day seek to have an inspired conversation with someone you love or someone you just met today or you've met along the way. Ian was sharing all about stories, you know, and how the sharing of the stories and as he does, as he's doing loss at Luminato Festival, the stories are happening and he's been sharing this journey of loss. For over nine years, they've been cultivating this in different platforms. So stories, everyone has a story and everyone's story is significant. Your conversations can be inspired by your truth, your love. Make sure that, you know, you take the time to pause. And when you ask someone, Ian, how are you doing? You pause, you stop, you listen, and you really take care. And if you don't want to know, don't ask the question. I'm, I'm just keeping it real. Let's just, let's just keep it real. And, you know, I hope you can see the victory moments in your week ahead, in this day ahead. The day is not over yet. And 
you know, as we get ready to leave this space, you know, I encourage you to stay in the victory mindset that you will be victorious as you go through your own personal wellness, your own mental health and wellness, you know, have a vision for your mental health and wellness, be intentional about it. How will you achieve that vision? Cultivate the vision. And when you cultivate it, that's when you see the transformation happen. Ian, you so share tonight how when you decided to take a look back and reflect, you became intentional. You went to Trinidad, you learned what was going on. You came, you became insightful and in tune about yourself and transformation is happening and it's got a continuous journey. It's not something that is just a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. And tonight, please give Ian his ovation because the O, you know, we got to give it up. We got to shout it up. You know, drop some love, some hearts, drop some, you know, comments in the chat. The comments are nicer because the hearts go away, but the comments stay forever. Go and follow him. Let him know what matters. You know what? You can show ovation to Ian, to Roger, the family, the whole team at the production company by going to see the show. And if you can't go see it, like I'm going to be away, but I can buy a ticket for a young person or a group of people and send someone. We need to make sure that we do our self-care and restore and replenish each other. I love it, Ian, when you said, you're going to take some rest after this. And in order for you and I and all of us to have victory in our mental health and wellness, that we got to say yes to ourselves and we got to yield to the process. Victory, people, is your portion. You are in the revolution if you choose to be of shifting your perspective of your mind and minding your mind and sustaining to yourself to live a victorious lifestyle daily no matter what comes at you so thank you for tuning in thank you for you know coming on here ian it has been such a joy and an honor Thanks to have the victory speak show and letting your victory speak you are totally victorious i'm going to say it again isn't he super califragilistic espionidocious yes you are and so um definitely go check on luminato go get the tickets the show is going to be on there and and support 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 and Ian, I'm going to see you backstage. And everyone, good night. Have a good rest. Take some time for yourself. And remember, even if you said no to someone, it's saying yes to yourself. Don't answer that call. Don't answer that email. Go do something. Take a walk. Drink some juice. Have some ice cream. Have some fun. Whatever it is, say yes to you. And be, give yourself some self-compassion. This is Nicole, your voice of victory and your mental fitness coach with Ian Kamau. Say good night. God bless.